in 2001, uh, the New England Journal of Medicine receives uh, two publications. Uh, one from France and one international. One, a study on corticosteroids in severe sepsis, severe infection. Another one, the study on a new drug activating protein C in severe sepsis. The study uh, from corticosteroids was originated in France, was submitted to New England Journal before the Eli Lilly study, and showed a 10% absolute reduction in mortality in the largest subgroup of patients that have relative adrenal insufficiency. I'm not going to go there. It's not worth it. But anyway, it was associated with the reduction in mortality. The Lilly study was a larger study. The first was 300 patients. The Lilly was about 15, 1,600 and there was a 6% absolute reduction in mortality. And there was almost a significance for severe complication, but not there, almost there. Now, the New England Journal of Medicine rapidly reviews and published online first the Lilly study. Okay? And this is associated with editorial, a huge campaign of propaganda from the industry. The French study is not returned. The French people look at the publication of the other study and say, hey, what's going on with our study? Okay? And they say, oh, we're going to send it to you. So five months after submission, they return the study to the French people. I was one of reviewers, so I know the story. Okay? They return it to them, and they say, you need to make changes. They make the changes, they return it, and they don't hear anything until three days later, the FDA approved the Lilly drug. So in other words, the New England Journal of Medicine kept for 11 months a very important study showed that there is a cheap, effective treatment for one of the most life-threatening diseases we have on earth, okay, and rejected after 11 months, okay? Now, the Figaro, two years later, published an article and reveals all this and clearly states that if the FDA had received information, the study was published concomitantly, would have been very important for scientists, for, for, for doctors to see two things comparing each other, the Lila Lily study would not have been approved by the FDA. Why? Because the approval was 10 to 10. The, the approval, approval of the drug, not the study. The FDA this would never approve approved the drug. Approved, yep. Divided in two, 10 and 10 on each side. And what they say, they receive before the uh, approval, the FDA call for comments. I send comments. They say, hey, look, there is another study here. You better make a comparison. There was the French study. The French people sent all the information about their study. But the reason why they did not look at that study is because it was not published. So in other words, the New England Journal of Medicine assisted a private company in achieving FDA approval by blocking an inexpensive drug that was highly effective and more effective uh, publication. This is incredible. Okay, absolutely incredible. Now yes, what happens? Is... Go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to say that this is one of the things people do not understand about the peer review process. People think that the peer review process just means that science will be reviewed by scientific peers. And it is anything but. It is a uh, secret, anonymous mechanism whereby competitors both, you know, the joke is it's peer preview. Peers get a preview of what you're going to release informationally. This is a place where people who are not powerful in their fields have things stolen very yeah. frequently. But it also provides a mechanism in which you can tie up a result over a long period of time. And the New England Journal of Medicine, which you would assume, you know, based on its title and based on its long history, is just simply interested in publishing good studies that will allow people to understand better what's taking place. But in this case, it appears to be acting on behalf of a private company that has an inferior drug in which it has invested who knows how much money and wishes to bring it to market and have doctors prescribe it. They're actually intervening against doctors comprehending the comparison between two substances, one 
long known and well understood, the other new and expensive. And this is certainly resulting in patients getting uh, inferior care, to say the least, some of whom will die from that inferior care. Have I understood it correctly? Yes. There is no, there is no doubt. Uh, there is a lot of, I won't say a lot, but there is, there is corruption out there and there are interests. And, you know, and for, since civilization started, money counts, money talks. So people that are powerful can influence things. Uh, even if they're not apparent, but they well, can do it. You say there's a lot of corruption, and I, having been focused on corruption for several decades now, I can tell you it does not spark the correct image in the mind, that capture is closer, because what we're really talking about is not just a lot of corruption. We're talking about a preponderance of corruption, mm. where the majority of influence over what drug gets prescribed is coming from perversely incentivized companies rather than uh, properly incentivized researchers who have no stake in whether a drug looks good or bad. It's obvious that we in the public should want people who have no stake whatsoever to study these questions to tell us what they found and how they found it, and then we should discuss what is the right thing for patients. It is obvious that if you put pharma in a position to fund studies, to contract them, to uh, incentivize the system of scientific evaluation in various ways, both obvious and not so obvious, that they will end up creating a world in which, lo and behold, their drugs are exactly what patients need. The drugs that might otherwise be given to patients are too dangerous and not effective enough to be given. And doctors are left with no choice but to expose themselves to professional and financial risk if they depart from this phony orthodoxy. I mean, I, I, I feel in hearing your story, here's what I know. I know that this isn't something that happened related to COVID, right? I know this goes back at least two decades and probably farther than that, and that the degree of control is far beyond what I had imagined. I mean, in essence, in hearing your story, I can't help but feel embarrassment over my own naivete on the matter. 